Right, so I did the thing again where I just um, stop recording and then immediately start recording. So welcome back to the Farming Simulator series. We're back again working in Field 1. I believe that's the one we were just working in last time. And as you can see, I'm in a tractor that, despite being too big for the cedar, is actually barely able to run it. Like on the way over here, the front wheels were barely on the ground. The thing barely braked. Um, like I could barely steer it. We're 10% complete already, which is good because I'm not enjoying this job. Oh, and by the way, we're operating on a loss. So I bought one of the small little bags of seed, a small little bag of oat seed, because this is meant to be an oat field. And, um, yeah, that was a mistake <laughs> because that was just 50 quid wasted. And you see how bad this thing maneuvers. And hold on, I don't think I need um, to have that thing in the ground. This is contract work. Am I too close to the... No, it is working, okay. Go away, this is contract work. You're letting me do it, so clearly you're okay with me doing this. But yeah, so I'm operating at a loss because I had spent 900 on the bag of seed, and because this is um, going to basically, because I borrowed the items, I'm getting less than 900 for doing this job. So that's fun. Uh, but yeah. Try not to complain too much. Am I actually drilling anything? Because the seed doesn't seem to be going down. Okay, no, we're 24% complete. That's good. I won't have to be doing this job for long. Anyway, today's video, I would like to talk to you about theologians I like. Um, basically, just giving you some theologians that I like, why I like them. Maybe some things where, you know, they've said or done something that I'm not too happy with. I'm going to turn the lights on because it's easier for me to see now that I don't have the thing down. Um, just just basically a list of theologians. This is a small little mini-series I might keep going. I think I've probably done a video like this. I don't remember. Maybe. Uh, but this is just a small little mini-series I'm going to keep going. Anytime I really want to record, but I can't think of a video topic um, in time to record, I'll just do like one of these series. So anytime you see one of, or one of, the, one of these episodes, so anytime you see like one of these episodes, just know I really wanted to get in and make you guys content, but I wasn't creative enough that day. So, I guess we'll just get started with, uh, by the way, welcome to the series, anybody who's new before we get started. I should probably start doing proper introductions to this series, shouldn't I? Because I haven't really done any. We're on like episode 16, and the first one I did was like episode 15, so like last time. Um, and I really wish this vehicle, this slash tool is reserved for contract work, would message would go away, because it's really annoying me. Um... Yeah, so anyway, um, welcome to the Farming Simulator Let's Play series. This is a series where I get on to Farming Simulator and I just talk crap about whatever I feel like, usually in relation to the Christian worldview. And now is the moment of truth. Well, no, no, is not yet the moment of truth to see whether or not I'll be able to do this field properly I because I left the marker down. So when we go over this marker, it'll be the moment of truth to see can I actually do this. And by the way, that's the reason why... I um, have the lights on, so I think I explained it, did I? I forget. I have the lights on so I can actually see the difference between the textures in the uh, in the ground. And I can barely see that anyway, uh, from the first person point of view. So this is a series where I get on and I just talk about random nonsense that I feel like talking about for about half an hour, maybe a bit less, maybe a bit more, depending on the day. Sometimes in order to reach the half an hour, I ramble nonsensically for the last like 10-15 minutes, but sure, look at it's grand. And Come on, look how bad this thing handles, man. Um, I also give commentary on the gameplay because it is still a Let's Play series. I might just keep this in the ground, to be honest, because it seems to work better when it's in the ground. Why is it saying... It's... What? It's still saying it's reserved for contract work, but it's letting me do it. I'm so confused. This is really odd because like it's it's clearly like it's it's uh, like this is the right field it wouldn't do anything if it wasn't the right field i don't know man anyway so yeah i get on and i talk about the game i'm playing or uh what well, mostly it's the topic of the video that i talk about um interjected with little comments about the gameplay like my annoyances because i do love this game i do really like this game 
It's got some problems. So, this is just a list of theologians I like. I'm kind of going off the top of my head. First one I think is going to be uh, fairly obvious to a lot of you is uh, John MacArthur. Now, I think I'll start off with things I maybe don't like about the theologian. Just to get them out of the way to show, yeah, I know they're not perfect. And then move on to things I do like. Just to, you know, I think that's a fine way of doing it. So, first of all, John MacArthur, things I don't like. Um, I don't... So he's been involved in a few controversies. Um, that's fairly well known. I'm, sh I'm sure most of you who hate him <laughs> will um, be sure to let me know that in the comments as if I didn't already know. He's been involved in the recently the whole mental health isn't real controversy and the uh, controversy of you know excommunicating a woman for not going back to her abusive husband. I don't believe he was right in either of those cases. There's a few other controversies as well. I don't believe he was in the right in either of those cases. I'm not going to sit here and defend him in those cases. People say, how could you defend MacArthur? I personally don't. Um, I believe that the sending the woman back is due to his theology of marriage. He doesn't believe that abuse is a, um, a legitimate reason for divorce. I personally do. Um, if I didn't believe that, then I would probably be in agreement with the decision um, to have to want her to go back to the uh, marriage. But because I do believe that abuse is a legitimate reason for divorce, I don't think he was right to want her to go back to that marriage. And the uh, mental health thing, well, again, like I have ADHD, so of course I don't agree with him on that front. But that just seems more like old man believing old man things, you know, that, that I don't think there's anything malicious there. So I'm aware of those things. The man isn't perfect. And also there's a culture around him where I'm probably, even though I'm sitting here saying he's one of my favorite theologians, and he really is, even though I'm sitting here singing his praises for the next however long, uh, because I started off with literally any criticism of him, there are going to be some MacArthur fanboys um, and fangirls who will start screeching and who will get very upset because the man has a culture of almost worship around him. Um, people do nearly worship him, and that's something that's been noticed a lot. There's a lot of people who I think are really, really overly fond of him. Um, it goes beyond respect to, like I say, almost worship, almost idolatry. Um, you know, so it's like, it's it's just, it's it's weird. And but I'm sure, like, that's not necessarily his fault, and I'm sure that's something that even he would gladly denounce. But that is um, an unfortunate downside that people like he's like uh, Marmite. You either love him or you hate him. You can't be like me where it's like I have great respect for him, but recognize he's done some stuff wrong. It's either he's literally the devil or he's the greatest thing God has ever done. So, um, yeah, I just think he's a pretty decent pastor. One, like he's like the only decent mega church pastor that I know of, because he he didn't start out as like a mega church pastor. I think he just started off as like a regular pastor and then his church grew into a mega church. So he was just still like a regular pastor at the end of the day. But John MacArthur, into the good stuff now, John MacArthur has been faithfully preaching um, verse by verse through the Bible for longer than a lot of people have been alive. He's been doing it now for like 55 years, a little over 55 years, I believe, um, which is mental and all in the same church. I think the average for like a pastor to stay in the church is like four years. Um, so it's it's amazing to have that longevity. And thankfully, that's not always the case. Like my pastor started our church, I think about like 20 years ago, 19, 20 years ago. And he's still the pastor there. So, you know, it's not always the case, of course. Um, it's a blessing to have a pastor who's actually willing to stay to, for the congregation. Uh, so that's something he, you know. He, he like apparently he used to get a lot of offers I believe, um, but he never took them because obviously you know he wanted to stay and help the people of Grace Church, which is admirable. And he has really been on the forefront of an awful lot of controversies and a lot um, a lot of theological controversies because he has seen things in the church that he knew were wrong and he has gone to call them out. For example, the excesses of the charismatic movement. Now I'm not I'm no longer necessarily a cessationist which he is. Um, I'm not sure where I stand at the moment, but I'm definitely not a charismatic, and I think the work he did on calling out the charismatic movement was invaluable. I have his books, Strange Fire and Charismatic Chaos. They're brilliant books. I'd recommend you go read them. 
Um, but this was just a movement that not a lot of people were calling out at the time, and so he kind of led the charge in a way on calling it out. Of course, now you have other people like Costi Hing and Justin Peters, things like that, to keep it accountable, but he was one of the first guys really to start putting it into the the general public of Christianity that, yeah, this is something that needs to be looked at, this is something we uh, need to be worried about. And he's written many books, he started a seminary, the Master Seminary, at least he's been involved in the starting of the seminary, from my understanding. He's written a commentary on the, on the entire Bible, which I have. Uh, he's written a study Bible. Uh, he's preached the entire New Testament and a good chunk of the Old Testament. Um, I don't believe all of his sermons are available, but pretty much all. Like I think he has a sermon available on every single book of the New Testament, on every verse of the New Testament. But I believe there were sermons he did like before they started doing cassettes that um, didn't get published or something. So not every sermon he's ever preached is available, but he has sermons on every verse of the New Testament which are available, going slowly through them. Um, some books, I think, multiple times. As well as that, he, like I say, has done a lot of work in the Old Testament, which is very valuable. So he's preached um, on an awful lot of the Bible. And that is great, a great help. And it's all free to be able to download or listen to on the Grace to You website and app, um, which is a very great tool for trying to understand verses from a Calvinistic, Baptistic sort of a perspective. Um, of course, I would agree with him on a lot of things. Uh, we would disagree on subjects like eschatology and so on, but we'd agree on our soteriology. Um, I'm aware he teaches the rapture, which... I do have a problem with, again, I'm not a fan of rapture theology, um, but it's no more dangerous in my opinion than like post-millennialism or what have you, so I'm a millennialist. So yeah, John MacArthur would be one of my top picks, one of my top favourite theologians. Next uh, would be a good friend of MacArthur, would have been R.C. Sproul. Um, R.C. Sproul, his book was one of the first books I picked up like a physical copy of. I think it was the first book I picked up just a physical copy of, just for my own self, just to read. Um, I got that book in America. I think I've described this story in my uh, episode on reading. Um, I got it in America. It was, now that's a good question. And it was an amazing book. I don't have it anymore. I gave it to someone. Um, but it was a brilliant book. I read it while in America. And it was really engaging, really. Just good to listen to. Again, he has... He, he wasn't a pastor for as long. I think he, he, he was a theologian for a long time, but he only started being a pastor in like the um, the late 90s. And then he passed away in 2017. So he wasn't a pastor for very long. So he didn't preach through as much of the Bible, but he did still preach through a fair chunk of the Bible. And Ligonier Ministries is now in the process of uploading those sermons onto their YouTube channel, which is a great help and a great resource because R.C. Sproul was a very intelligent man. Um who also fought a few theological battles of his own, uh, many times alongside John MacArthur. And he uh, he basically focused his ministry on helping people getting into theology. So uh, he founded Ligonier Ministries, which I don't believe was meant to be like a seminary. I think it was just for like lay people to study theology, I believe. I listened to the audio book of R.C. Sproul of Life not too long ago, so I should know this stuff. Um, but he, uh, he founded Ligonier Ministries, and that's obviously been a great help to so many people. He's written many books. Like I said, he was a pastor, so he preached a few brilliant sermons. Um, and just his stuff has been really helpful. Like his book, What is Reformed Theology? It's not a, an in-depth treatise of every single aspect of Reformed Theology, but it is great for if you're getting a start into trying to understand Reformed Theology, um, it, it's great for that, which is all it's meant to be. So his main focus in his ministries was trying to get people into theology. He wasn't the um, final great big source of theology that you would read. He wasn't, you know, the uh, he wasn't a substitute for any of the old guys, um, and he never tried to be. He was just something that you would read as like a gateway into um, the more in depth stuff, which I think is admirable because he was a brilliant man and he could have done. A lot more in-depth stuff if he wanted to but I think that was his passion was getting people into the theology on a more base level so that's that was really invaluable um, 
And so I think that if you're looking to get into, you know, reform theology, that sort of a thing, I would say start with R.C. Sproul, what is reform theology? Um, it's a great introduction for someone like me who's not very smart and who um, would have maybe a bit of trouble with understanding some of these things. And am I missing a bit? I think I am, am I? I can't tell. I don't think I am. Am I? Oh, it doesn't matter. We're 97% complete anyway, it'll be grand. Um, so yeah, his works are really amazing. And I would highly recommend, I don't really have to do this properly. <laughs> um, I would highly recommend R.C. Sproul to people. Next is someone who I wouldn't recommend as highly, but is still someone that I have a great respect for, that was really helpful to me um, when I started out my Christian walk. And I think is someone who, it doesn't hurt to listen to him. And that would be Billy Graham. Now, Billy Graham was really more of an evangelist than he was a theologian. Uh, but he did write theological books, like I recently read his book on angels. And there we go, I can finish this contract. Collect. Uh, I don't think... Oh, I, wait, I made more than a grand off that. Did I make the money back for buying the, for buying the fertilizer, or buying the um, thing? I might have done. Okay, new contract. Please. Is it just for... Oh, this one pays less. Do you know what I might do? I might just skip the day into tomorrow um, I just wait for tomorrow to come I have seasons off don't I yeah seasons no okay so wait for tomorrow and then see if there's anything new uh, tomorrow or just even while this is happening let me see is there new contracts No. Um, so next, like I said, was Billy Graham. Um, so he, like I said, is more so a an evangelist than he was a theologian. So he believed things that I'm not a fan of, like he was an Arminian and so on. But overall, his theology was pretty solid. It was pretty decent. Um, there are people who, especially in like the reform camp, who don't really like Graham. But he preached the true gospel. Now, again, he had problems. He... Um, Later on in life, he did some interviews where he said stuff like, you know, the, there are people in faraway, like whatever it was, it's like they don't really know Jesus, but um, I can't remember what the exact quote was, but it's like they, they, have, they don't know Jesus, but they, hope, they hold on to something. I can't remember the quote. I don't want to misrepresent him, but I can't remember it off the top of my head, but it seemed to a lot of people to be universalism. I don't believe he was a universalist. I think that he was trying to get across another message. Maybe he got across, maybe he got across badly. Like he was trying to say, oh, well, Christ can reach people even in these like untouched tribes and stuff. Um, rather, oh, 666 loan interest. That's not good. Um, of course, the number 666, by the way, people are afraid of it. To my understanding, that number only has any significance when like connected to the mark of the beast. Um, apart from that, it has no real significance. So you don't need to be afraid of the number 666. Anyway, uh, so Graham... He said that, but like in his last message, or a video that's up on his YouTube channel recorded just a few days before he passed away, like he was talking about how the cross and the cross alone is, you know, what man needs and so on. So I don't believe he was ever a universalist. I think he was trying to get across a very different idea um, and he just fumbled a little bit, um, which, you know, happens. Uh, but yes, I mean, he, he spent his entire life preaching the true gospel um, so I doubt that in the last few years he just completely gave up on that, only to then go back to it again just before he passed away. Uh, another problem with him is he's way too ecumenical, not just with like Roman Catholics and the like, but also with, uh, yes, 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 okay, mowing. Mowing is a good job, I like mowing. Uh, okay, we'll go with times two time, I think is decent. Okay, um, where was it? Oh, is, is, is this the only new contract? I want to get another bathing one. I want to get one with silage. No, I don't think I will. This looks like fun, though. Hmm. I hate that these are the ones I always get for these jobs, because they're horrible to use. Alright. Let's, um... We'll accept both of them. I'll borrow the items for this one, and I will 
except this one. Oh, it's a bit laggy. And of course I won't get these done in this video, but I can at least get a uh, start on it. Uh, Alright, there's the bag I tried to buy. <laughs> They give me a rake. I was wondering. I thought they didn't for a second. I didn't see it. Um, I need to connect all this stuff. So yeah, Graham had a few problems. Of course. Um, no one's perfect. But overall, I think he did wonderful work. I think God did wonderful work through him. So I'm happy to recommend Billy Graham. Uh, next would... Oops, next would be Justin Peters. Now, Justin Peters is uh, an evangelist, and he's someone who spends a lot of time on the whole, uh, like I mentioned before, the whole charismatic issue. And all these fields are right next to each other. That's good. So he mainly does stuff on like YouTube and, and that, and on his blog site, I think. Um, but he also does like a lot of uh, evangelism work. He travels around the world. He's been to, uh, I think, every continent except Antarctica or something. And he's been to most of the states in the US, so he is someone who was evangelized in a lot of different places and he's preached his seminar Clouds Without Water on the dangers of the false teaching in certain modern movements. Um, and he was a great help to me in becoming a cessationist. Now again, I'm no longer a cessationist, necessarily. I'm not sure what I am. Um, but his stuff is still very valuable. Um, because it's, it's good to hold these people accountable. It's, uh, it's necessary to hold them accountable, in fact. So, I still find his work to be of great value. And hold on, let me just set this up here. Um, so, problems with Justin Peters. There are times where I think he's a bit, um, a bit too harsh, possibly. Uh, or he doesn't go about things the way maybe he should. That does happen sometimes. Usually he's fine. Usually he handles it all quite well. But there have been times where he responded to something in a mocking way or something like that. Where I thought that maybe isn't necessarily a, uh, an appropriate response to the situation. Um, but that's rare. Usually he's sound. Can I? Yeah. I want to move that in there because I don't want to miss any of it. Uh, if I miss a little bit it's not the end of the world sure. I'll be heading all this up anyway. So yeah, there are some times like that where I'm not a big fan of the way he handles certain situations. But overall, like I say, he's fine. Um, and he does he does more good than harm, if you will. So I think that the service he does to the Christian community is not just a good one, but perhaps an essential one in holding these people accountable. Because you can tell that there are a lot of people who don't want them to be held accountable. There are a lot of people who would rather just blindly believe uh, what these people say, the claims they make, or, yeah, I went to heaven, or, yeah, Jesus appeared at the end of my bed playing the saxophone, and, yes, someone actually did claim that that happened to them. So, there's not a lot of accountability in these circles. People are happy to just kind of believe the claims. So, it's good to have something like that where, you know, you have somebody who is willing to stand up and say, no, we need to take this stuff seriously. And he's been involved with... Um, number of different things uh, he was in you know the American Gospel documentary I think he did something a bit earlier on um, an expose on Benny Hinn this was, it was a documentary came out that was kind of exposing Benny Hinn which was obviously a, a service that was needed in the Christian community because Benny Hinn's a, a scoundrel and a false teacher um, and if you can't see that I'm sorry there's no hope for you because of course he is that's like one of the most obvious false teachers I've ever seen in my life so Justin Peters is another one that I would generally recommend to people, even if you're not a cessationist. Um, most of the work he does uh, is on not just about the about like charismatic movement in general or like continuationism in general. Mostly, it's about the uh, absolute crazies that come out of that movement. So, I'm going to end the video here. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll finish mowing this field. I'll mow the next, or maybe, um, no, I don't think I will, I think I'll leave it till next time. I was going to do a lot of mowing and then tedding and stuff and then bail it in the next episode, but no, I think I'll, 
I'll leave it till the next episode. And having the front mower on is more of a hindrance than anything at this stage because I'm missing so much. But yeah, I um, hope you guys have enjoyed this video. If you have anything you'd like me to talk about, any topics or anything like that you'd like me to cover, please do let me know. I'm always interested to hear you guys' suggestions. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it for today. Thank you guys for watching. Goodbye and God bless.